Good afternoon. I'm going to call the meeting order for the Friday, October 25th, 2013 meeting of the Buckner County Health and Human Services Board. We uh, looked at the agenda. Does anybody have any question about the agenda? Addition, subtraction? So I have a motion that we accept the agenda as presented. <coughs> so moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Now we move to the uh, minutes. Um, I'm, I'm must say that uh, Krista found that uh, there was a date that was uh, wrong. Uh, it indicates in your minutes that August, that it should be September 27th, and she's already made that change. And so the official uh, minutes will show that. Any other correction or additions to the uh, minutes? I move approval. I move approval. Second. second. Move second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Good. Okay, Jim. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. On your afternoon. iPad, you'll see the uh, tab for financials for the month ending September 30th. You also have them on the screen if you want to look at the screen. We're 25% through our fiscal year ending September 30th. And really no surprises or no changes from the last couple of months that we've seen. As you see where we're above the 25% mark, remember aging services on how we pay out that contract for our community contracts, depending on our payment schedule of how we provide those payments. Some of those are paying a little bit in ahead, ahead. So that's why we're over in that. And then administration, if you remember, that's because of paying for unemployment and workers' compensation insurance at the beginning of the year for the entire year. Overall, we're under the 25% of where we could be in spending while meeting all of our services. Next, we look at public health budget, 25% uh, through the year. And we'll see that we're right on track with our spending patterns as we had last year. Uh, one area where we're above 25% is in administration again. And again, that's because of unemployment and workers' compensation premiums that are paid at the beginning of the fiscal year. Just as a reminder, we'll give you an update on revenues. We'll do that twice a year. We'll do that at the end of the first six months so that you have a clearer picture of where we are in revenues. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I just want to make sure I understand it. Does this yes, mean we have no contracts in the health area? Uh, we have no specific contracts, yes, that we, that we paid out. That's correct. Right. So I can understand what it means when there's nothing there. Yes. We have it there but because there was a comparison to last, last year. Last year. Okay. Thank you. Where are our, uh, I'm sure that's this before, where are our contracts for like winches and projects? No, <laughs> project access, where do they reside within the overall budget? Uh, project Access has its own separate accounting unit that sits outside of both DSS and HELP. Okay. And uh, the contract that we have with Vinnie Jones is the same way. It sits in a community okay. contract. It has a, it's a community contract. Okay. Yes. So is that listed here? Oh, yeah. It is. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. As you know, we are still involved with uh, orientation since we are a new board trying to gain all the experience we can in, in regards to the areas that we will be involved with. And so to continue with that, Angie. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm very honored to introduce two professionals to you. Many of you know Tammy Shook, who's been in this work, we talked about it this week, for 25 years, believe it or not. And she is very well regarded across the state for her expertise with her colleagues and her peers, and I highly respect this woman and the work she's done. And our newest member of our management team is Katie Turk. Katie hails um, from Catawba County and worked there for 12 years, has her LCSW. 
She um, is our newest addition and has just taken off running, so we're really happy to have her. So Tammy and Katie are going to do an overview for you today, a very broad overview about the front end of Child Protective Services, which includes intake, investigative assessment, and family in-home. A couple of you, Candrus and Jennifer, have heard parts of this. Um, we really want this to be interactive, so please interject, ask questions. When you walk away today, our intention and hope is that you understand on a very broad level what it is this front end work does in the community. All right. Thank you, Angie, and good afternoon. I must have done a really good job in my interview because one of the tasks I had to do was present a mock uh, presentation to the board, and here I am, less than three months in, and in front of all of you. So we shall see. It's a little different uh, in this room versus the six people walking before. But um, what we're going to do today, Tammy and I together, are going to walk through um, just intake, which I oversee the family assessment response, which is part of the investigations in child welfare, and the forensic track. We're also gonna talk about uh, philosophy within our child welfare unit, which is um, using an ABA guide and decision making. And we're gonna talk about a framework that we use as well called signs of safety. I also oversee the in-home service area, and we'll talk about that as well today. And this is just a quick uh, part of the organizational chart that shows the intake unit and the supervisors there. And we didn't, um, it obviously is missing the workers, but there's about, um, intake and on call has about 12 to, and then two part times. So in, chi in child welfare and adult intake, which is the social work intake, so we're talking about both child welfare and adult. At this side, um, this slide talks about when a report comes in for child abuse and neglect, what happens? And so, obviously, if it meets statutory definition for abuse, neglect, or dependency, then the report is screened in and an investigator is signed. Uh, that is always a two-level decision, meaning the worker and the supervisor make that decision together. There are times where it's questionable and a program administrator might be included in that. The, policy expects that at least two levels are making that decision at all times. We also have three responses. We can respond immediately, we can respond in 24 hours, or the latest and longest it would ever take us to respond would be 72 hours. And that's based on how serious the allegations are. An example of something that we respond immediately to, law enforcement is calling us out when a child is seriously injured, we would respond immediately to that. Something we might wait 72 hours for would be um, neglect. Uh, maybe a child has been left alone in the past, but they're not home alone right now. And so we might wait uh, three days would be the longest we're gonna wait on that. Um, and if you are a reporter or any reporter, you can be anonymous. However, it, it, as a person who wants to give their address and name, you can find out if uh, your report was screened in and then also the decision that's made at the end of the investigation. Adult ser protective services is really some of the same categories, the only differences. And a lot of times people misunderstand adult protective services because they think that it's only the elderly, but it's actually involving people that are disabled. And so when we get a report in adult protective services, we're looking to see um, is there a disabled quality to this person that makes them vulnerable? That means we would get involved. Otherwise, the response times, the two-level decision, and the fact that you can get information as a reporter if you choose to give your name and address are the same. In, uh, social work intake also has other functions, although those are the, the major ones are accepting reports. But we do um, every service inquiry that comes in, any call that's made is written up and um, taken down for social workers and so we have a process for that. They also receive all assists and transfers from other counties and as you can imagine people are pretty transient so we have quite a few of those uh, where maybe another county is the main county involved and the father or child live in our county and so we would be helping work those cases as well and that's what an assist is. A transfer would be 
let's say Haywood County, the family moves to Buncombe County, and so now we are um, assuming the responsibility of that pay. We also, um, uh, I'm trying to read my own slide. Uh, <laughs> Child Protective Services, um, we answer many questions for a variety of reasons, and we interact with all the different agencies in sending um, you know, questions and phone calls and transfers throughout the organization. And when we do screen out reports for um, investigation, many of those, and we'll see a slide in a few minutes that has the statistics about that, but are sent to preventative services where families are offered voluntary services in order to meet the needs, even if they don't rise to a mandated level. Question? I'm sorry. So when uh, a decision goes back to a reporter who wants to receive that information back, is it relatively generic information, mm -hmm. uh, screened in, screen, uh, yes. active case? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really much more than that. It's pretty it's much we tell them, yes, it was screened in or no, it was screened out. And then we also will tell them, yes, a decision was made. If we substantiate or no, we did not substantiate. That's pretty much all the information they get. Um, in an unaccepted report, if we don't accept the report, we do also send them a letter and we usually write a rationale as to why we didn't accept the report so that people understand that. Give an example of an unaccepted report. So, um, I'm trying to think up in my head. So, so a person calls in because they're worried about their neighbor, but they can't really explain what they're worried about. They're not giving any specific impact to the children. You know, they think that this might be happening or that might be happening. We get a lot of people that are worried, but they don't have specific incidents. So we would need, we would explain that, yes, that may be concerning. However, that doesn't rise to the level of abuse, neglect, or dependency. I'm trying to think of a specific. A very specific one is often ones involving drugs where people call us and say, I think mom is using meth. Okay, well, were the children present when mom used meth? What was the impact of the children? Because believe it or not, just a parent using drugs, even if you know that for sure, is not a report unless you can tell us what the impact of the children was. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of something that's screened out. That was what we were just talking about. So, so where would they, where would the referral go to then? You, you mean if we make a, uh, sometimes we'll refer, re, a couple months ago, Becky um, Kessel's group talked about at risk and different under six program, um, other voluntary services that might be available in the community. We may let them know about this family um, and a need they may have, but we wouldn't be involved at a child protective services or adult protective services level. Does that make sense? When the decision is made going back to do it immediately or waiting 72 hours, is that one person that makes that decision or the team? No, it's a two-level decision. So supervisor is always involved. And then some of the tougher decisions, a program administrator may be involved in that as well. When it's a little more finding. One of the things I was going to say in my intro and elected to do is Child Protective Services is an involuntary service, right? So unless, it, it, what, what the deal is, if the, the person that gives you the allegations, if those allegations are true, would it then rise to the statutory level of abuse, neglect, or dependency? If the answer to that is no, we have no legal authority to enter um, that family's life, which is why we refer to prevention. So I, I didn't set the stage well for that. And I think that speaks to some of the questions you all have. Define dependency. Legal dependency. Yeah, legal yes, and um, it's when there's no parent, guardian, or caretaker that is able or willing to provide care for the children. And some examples of that is the death of a parent, um, a parent who's in an accident and unconscious, or um, sometimes when they're you know hospitalized in Capestone and they're not considered competent at that moment to make placement for their children. So those are just some. Basic examples. We, we rarely have a, I mean, we have a few, but rarely have a pure dependency. Typically, if you have an allegation of dependency, there's an element of neglect involved too, typically. So, um, I was at a presentation last night with a couple of folks in this room were talking about the graying of America and the graying of Western North Carolina. How's that impacting us in terms of, so a lot of what you hear 
um, in the news, unfortunately, are around child welfare issues. But it seems like with elder issues, it would be a more challenging framework because, you know, um, someone may say this person has dementia. Is, is that enough? You know, what constitutes the visit? Because, I mean, I can think of at least two incidences right now that probably need to be coming your way. <laughs> um, and I just think that's going to be challenging for any, any service provider of Health and Human Services because, you know, as you age, people are less likely to be willing to admit they have a challenge. Yeah, and the difference with adult protective services versus uh, child protective services is that you still have... Um, Sorry, I'm still learning the adult side, but right, the self-determination. And so, you know, I'm sorry? What's that right. word? Right to self-determination. Right. Their rights, yes. And so if a person chooses and has the capacity to make that decision, then we don't have the right to intervene in those type of cases. And unless they're disabled and there is a, it, uh, they're not competent in that way. Mm -hmm. And so that is a different level when we're talking a lot of this, for, this presentation is around children, right. and that is a different side to the um, social work. So determining capacity will come through the primary care provider, because the patient, I mean, the person may say, oh, I know what I'm doing, I know my name, yeah. I know how to do this. And by the time things are going on, is a is the, the final decision rendered by the primary care provider to say, look, this is what's been reported. We need to determine capacity of this patient. Is that what needs to happen? It's the okay. same gathering so of information and then assessing everything yeah. you've learned to make that determination. But the caretaker is involved and at a high level. We are going to focus on adult protective services soon. We put this together because our intake does both. But what you're saying is true, Sharon. When we go and do an assessment, if there's a question about somebody's ability to have that capacity to make decisions, we do rely on their primary care provider or a mental health provider to help us figure out, does that person have the capacity to make their own decisions or do we need to talk to the clerk of court about a guardian for them? I'm sorry, so I took us down report. that path. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's okay. I opened the, when in that report. I opened the door. <laughs> And I open the door to that, and like Angie said, we will be talking some more about adult protective services they'll be presenting and can give a lot more answers to that. Um, this is the child protective service reporting data in the last year, so um, as most recent as we have. There were 5,300 reports received, and then we accepted 37, a little over 3,700. And you can see there that we actually um, sent to that voluntary service of the unaccepted or the screen out reports about half of those. Uh, and what it is, is we made a, an automatic referral to that under six program that's a voluntary program for parents for any child that comes in that is under the age of six. So we have a high number of those that um, in that population and so you can see that we're making those referrals and hoping that people will take advantage of some of the prevention services we have in the community and um, on the adult side we also ex received 14 over 1400 almost 1500 reports and accepted a little over 1100 of those and now Tammy is going to talk to you about child protective investigation so again, I just wanted to um, take a small part of the A chart and let you see kind of where I sit. Um, and I am over all of the investigations uh, for Child Protective Services for Beckham County. And that's the group of supervisors that I'm very honored to have work with me because they're awesome at what they do every single day. And if you'll notice, I just wanted to point out that Lori Dotson, the one on the end, we're doing something pretty unique with her. She actually has two Child Protective Services workers who are forensic, and I'm going to talk about that. And she has three Adult Protective Services workers that she supervises. So we're not only blending a little bit, in, in, or always, in intake, but now we're starting to blend a little bit in the actual supervision of the investigators, because it's a very similar function. Okay, so about 10 years ago, North Carolina uh, began something called Multiple Response System, which is a dual-track response to Child Protective Service reports. And you'll see up there, there's one track called Investigation. We also refer to that as Forensic. 
and the family assessment approach. The thing I want to draw your attention to is that both of these are non-voluntary services. So both of these are where that intake process has occurred and a valid CPS report has been accepted. A Child Protective Services report has been screened in, which invokes the jurisdiction that we can in, enter the, ch the family's life and intercede and intervene where we need to. So because there's dual response doesn't mean there's not a valid CPS report. There's a valid CPS report in both situations. The, the major difference is that um, in an investigation or a forensic report, there's a very prescribed way that you have to do the investigation. Very specific steps that you have to take. You have to interview the child victim first, non-victim children next, non-offending parent, offending parent. It's a very prescribed process. In the family assessment approach, we tend to call the family ahead of time and schedule with them. We tend to interview the entire family together. It's a much more family-friendly approach. And I can tell you from my years as an investigator, it's a whole lot easier to engage with a parent when you've talked with them on the phone and say, I need to come talk to you about some concerns in your family, rather than showing up and saying, hey, I've already been to your kid's school, I've already interviewed them and your kid's teacher, and now I'm here to tell you finally what it is that I'm concerned about. Do you see the difference in those two responses? <laughs> um, so family assessment response has been very, very um, helpful to us in um, engaging parents in a more meaningful way right out of the gate so that they're more willing to work with us. The other difference is around the findings, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. So the family assessment response, as I said, it's that differential response. It's a family-centered approach, and it lets us really focus on what needs to change in the family for these children to be safe and healthy and, and reared appropriately in their family versus placing a, a label or blame on the parent. And that's huge. I can remember sending um, letters as an investigator and as a supervisor to families where I had to say, we have found that you have neglected your children. Well, when I receive that as a parent, am I like really gung-ho to engage with you about change? No, I'm arguing with you that I'm not a neglectful parent. I, I'm not a bad parent, and so this really eliminates that. So forensic investigations and assessments, this is for those cases where there is severe abuse and very serious neglect. It typically involves, um, this, is, this is the classic that you hear in the news, shaken baby, subdural hematoma, fractured skull, broken bones, uh, the very serious abuse cases. And you'll notice up there it talks about collaboration effort with law enforcement. These are the cases that we work jointly with detectives because as much as I believe as a social worker, and this is what gets me up every day and brings me to work, that families have the ability to change and that we can work with them and make change so that they can parent their children effectively, I feel just as strongly that people who seriously harm children should be held accountable and that they should be charged criminally and they should serve jail time for that. So this allows us to work jointly with law enforcement on those very serious abuse cases and hopefully gain information that allows our district attorney to charge people when they've hurt children. Um, let's move on. So before I leave that, let me talk about something that um, has just recently happened and I apologize to the folks who heard this story already this week. We're focusing on becoming a trauma-informed child welfare system. Not just us, it's the state of North Carolina and it's nationally and we're part of a project in the state that's working on that and we were very honored this week to have Dr. Tripp Ake from Duke University come and talk with us and our Health and Human Services Advisory Committee about trauma-informed child welfare practice. And we've been working on this for about a year in our county and recently we had a situation where a child experienced just an extreme level of trauma and I can't go into a lot of specifics for confidentiality purposes, but our investigator responded, and this is in the midst of crisis, tons of police officers there, um, EMS, and this child who's, who's 12 was present. And our worker, which we've always been very good at, at assuring physical safety, that we haven't always been focused on psychological safety. And so the worker responding did a really good job of really focusing on it for this child. And part of what this child needed was one, for the officer not to put down his dog. He was acting aggressively on scene and the social worker intervened and basically said, can we 
can we just take a minute here and, and kind of get the dog where he needs to go? The social worker the next day arranged for the, social, the child to visit his dog. Um, the child was screened for trauma and was in therapy within two days with a specifically trained trauma-informed therapist who could work with this child. And then as we met with this child, and he was very concerned about some of the things at his home, and he said, this is what I need. I need my dad's tools, I need my birth certificate, and I need my mom's wedding rings. Mm -hmm. And so who would have thought that a 12-year-old child needed those items to feel safe? I would have gone in there, which I've done before in the past in cases where I've had to go back into homes and picked up teddy bears and you know things that I thought would make a child feel safe, but that's what he needed to feel safe. So we worked with law enforcement to go back on scene with this child and allowed him to get the things that he needed to feel safe. And I'm just very, very proud of that example because to me it shows that not only has our staff always done a very good job about safety physically for children, we're really moving forward in child welfare and considering the impact of this, this child and the trauma that he's experienced and making sure that he's psychologically safe as well, or as psychologically safe as we can make him be. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how do we make these decisions, because I think that's the, the mystery to people in the community. How does child welfare decide when we remove a child and when we don't? And that's the chief complaint that I usually answer on the phone. We've either done too much or we've done too little. There is no happy medium for the public with child welfare. And so, what we look at when we're making a decision is, are these three things. What are the threats of danger to the child? What's the child's vulnerability to the threat? And what protective capacities does the parent have or not have to keep the child safe? So let's talk about that. So all of us at home have threats of danger, right? In your house, if you think about where you live, we all have threats of danger in our home. And if you have children, depending on their age, they're vulnerable or more vulnerable or less vulnerable to that threat. So let me give you an example. So how many of you, when you had toddlers, got all the little plastic thingies and plugged up all of your electrical outlets, right? Okay, yeah. And you did the, you know, you did the clamp thing on the cabinet door so they couldn't get in and all of that business. And so as your children aged and became, you know, elementary school age, you kind of backed off of that, right? You weren't so concerned about the electrical outlets because you're hoping by that point they figured out not to stick stuff in there, right? So then here's what happens if you're not paying attention. Then you have a niece or someone come over, this happens to us, and you're like, oh gosh, I haven't got my outlets covered up again, you know? And so you have a younger child and they're vulnerable to that danger again. Well, that's what we're looking at. What are the threats of danger in the home? And what's the child's vulnerability to that? Because you can have a threat of danger, but you may have a child that's not vulnerable to it. You can have a threat of danger, you can have a child that's vulnerable, but you can have a parent who is acting protectively and protecting the child from the threat of danger. Where we come in is where that is not happening. Where we come in and where we have to intervene is where you have a threat of danger, you have a vulnerable child, and you have a parent who either isn't acting protectively or can't or won't, okay? So we're looking at what's the difference between safety and risk. When we get out there in an investigation, which is what my folks do, we're looking at this immediate point in time. What is happening right now that says this child can't remain here or needs some type of intervention to be safe? Risk is that kind of vague notion about what could happen, what might happen in the future, right? And so it could be mild to serious, again, depending upon what the threat of danger is and what the child's vulnerability is. Is this making sense? Yes. Okay, so this is, I want, this is what social workers are thinking when they're out in the field working with families. So this is just what I've been talking about. And the ABA guide, what that stands for is the American Bar Association. And they had um, an attorney who worked with a National Resource Center Child Protective Services employee who got together and wrote this guide, and they actually wrote it for judges and for attorneys to use that really explains what I'm talking about so that judges get, it, get what we do. But we liked it so much that we're using it to explain how we make decisions. 
So this is just repeating what I talked about. So vulnerable children, they're safe when there are either no threats of danger or the family exhibits a sufficient protective capacities to take care of them. So how do we know that? Okay, so if I walk up on a scene where obviously there's something tragic happening, ladies and gentlemen, it's not rocket science to figure that one out, right? When you walk up and it's that blatantly obvious. But that's not typically what we deal with. Typically what we deal with is this vague report, like Dr. McClain's like, what, what do you do? So let's, let's go down that road. Mom's using meth and she's taking the baby with her and she's high while she's caring for the baby. The impact of that baby is it's not getting its needs met, right? Probably, if someone's high on meth. Well, how do we know that? Because if we walk out there, guess what? She's probably not high at the moment that we show up, right? So we're asking the information to answer <coughs> these six questions. And how do we answer those six questions? How do we gather that information? And that's where the skill level of the social worker is so important. It's observation. It's interviews. It's talking to collaterals, which might be law enforcement, neighbors, grandparents, other children, and trying to look holistically at the family, okay? Because let's say, I don't know how many of y'all raised a teenager, okay? But let's say you get a report like this. Dad hit the teenager and bested his lip. They got into a scuffle, dad hit the teenager and bested his lip. Okay, not good not appropriate, we can all agree about that, but if you've ever had a teenager, have you ever felt like hitting them? Yeah. I mean, have you ever really? I mean, seriously. And so when we go out there, we're not just focused on did dad hit him and best his lip? Because that's pretty easy to determine, right? The kid's like, dad hit me and bested my lip, okay. Let's look holistically at the family. What was going on? Had dad just lost his job? Um, was the kid, <laughs> was the kid late for curfew? Was the kid smoking dope and dad caught him in his room? I mean, there could be lots of factors that went in that led up to the point where dad hit the kid. So part of a good investigation is looking holistically. Is this how dad normally disciplines him? Or was it something out of ordinary? And we're going to look at all of that before we make a decision about involuntary services and what needs to go forward. I so while he's doing that, I, I can't figure out how to get to Safari or uh, Google to look it up. What's the difference between maltreatment and mistreatment? And mistreatment maltreatment yeah. and mistreatment. Yeah. What's the nature and extent of maltreatment? Maltreatment typically is what you used to talk about child abuse and neglect. I don't know. I don't know. Mis I always think it's mistreatment. We. We use the word maltreatment typically. It's the legal. It's the legal. legal? Yeah. Okay. I couldn't get to look it up here, so that's why I had to ask you. Yeah, that's typically what we use. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing to try to gather this information with families in a strengths-based approach is using another tool that we've been very fortunate to have exposure to. It's called Signs of Safety. And I'm going to turn it back over to Katie, and she's going to talk to you about that. <laughs> So Signs of Safety is a practice that Buncombe County started about three years ago and luckily enough Catawba where I'm from until the last couple months have been doing it as well. So um, we're going to talk about this practice in the same kind of framework and even though we're going to talk about it from an investigative point of view, this goes across all areas. So in, uh, intake uses this practice in-home uses this practice, some adult services folks have been using this practice, so we can um, adapt it to the social work area. Principles of partnership is kind of that piece that we started 10 years ago that Tammy was talking about, multiple response, and those are um, the six on the screen that you can see. Signs of safety principles um, are in line with that, and in fact kind of help us tease some of those areas out to get more specific about how we're going to put um, some of those principles into place. For example, how are we going to partner with families in a different way? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. 
there's some, uh, one of the things that Tammy had mentioned is that's difficult with Child Protective Services is how, not only decision making, but also the language that we use and how we explain how we got to a decision. And so not only are we using the ABA judges guide, but we're also using some other techniques that Signs of Safety has brought us. And those are harm statements, and you can see that under the building blocks area, danger statements. We also look at that existing safety or those protective capacities. And then in the, in the in-home side of things, which we'll talk about in a minute, we do safety goals and safety plans. And the goal is the positive side of the practice. So what do we want to see? If someone's using drugs and taking their child with them while they're using, what is the positive goal that we want to see? What we would want to see is that they either have a, either they don't use drugs or so they provide a sober home for the child to reside in or that they found someone else to be able to care for their child when they go out and use uh, drugs or drink or something like that. And so that's the positive activity that goes along with it. The safety plan is how are we gonna get there? And so if we have a goal, which is a sober caretaker, what are the steps gonna look like in order to get to that goal? And we are becoming a lot more behaviorally specific in looking at that. And my computer just shut down. Hold on a minute. Okay, thank you. Oh, the one thing I, in the safety network, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a child and family team meeting, but we utilize those a lot where um, professionals and other community members as well as family informal supports come to meetings. And that really is building a safety network and signs of safety uses that terminology in order to help us understand that Department of Social Services isn't the responsible party for making sure that happens. It really is the family safety network. And so who is it that in this family is gonna be responsible for that? Is it grandma, is it uncle? Who's gonna share if this safety plan falls through? You know, what's, who's gonna step in if it falls through? That kind of thing. And so building a strong safety support network for the family is an important piece to this. So we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about a harm statements. And the harm statement is what happened. So what happened that caused us to get involved or what, and you can see it allegedly happened. So at the intake process, we don't know if it happened, but we're learning it, so it's reported. At the decision-making process, we know. So that's where we say, you know, this is what we found. And then the impact of the child. And, a, and an example of that was it was reported that mom and dad drink beer, take pain pills, and pass out while Joey is left on the floor to crawl around. Impact that he was burned on his hand from touching a kerosene heater. So that's really specific. That makes it easier when we're talking with families to explain why we're here and what we found, rather than you know, having conversations where we're kind of disagreeing. Families a lot of times will agree with and help us write these harm statements as we um, work through the uh, process. And danger statement. So we, are, we know what the harm is. Now we're looking at what the danger is. What's the future risk? And so this has three areas. Who's worried? And this is how we get buy-in from families when we use these statements and we create them with them. So we know that we're worried, but who else might be worried? Is your mom worried about your child? Is your dad, you know, is Uncle Susie, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, Uncle Susie. Uncle Sam, thank you. Uncle Susie. That's a boy named 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 Oh, that's funny. Yeah, that's yeah, that's We're listening. Yeah. We're I'm listening. glad. I'm yeah, glad. I'm paying attention. Um, and then the behavior of the caretaker. What might happen? So a lot of times if you have harm, then you use those same type of things to, to, to say what happened. And then what the possible impact would be for the future. Okay, this time he was burned by a kerosene heater, but what could happen in the future? And so in this statement, an example is DSS and grandma are worried that mom and dad will drink beer, take pain pills, and pass out, leaving Joey on the floor like the time when he burned his hand on the kerosene heater. And Joey could be hurt or killed 
in the future. And, you know, we don't always go to kill, but the reality is if there was a serious fire, that is a possibility. And we talk about that. You know, we don't want to over um, dramatize something, but at the same time, that is the reality and helps families buy into the concern at a different level than if we're just talking without being specific. So I'm going to show you a video, and we found a video from the news of another county so that we were not um, having any problems around confidentiality. But I'd like you to think about the things we just talked about. So if you were going to help us write a harm and danger statement, what happened? Who was worried? What's the impact? What would the possible future impact be as you watch this video? And then we're going to talk about that. New details tonight about a couple who police say smoked a cocktail of drugs before leaving their three-year-old in a bathtub full of water. Action 7 News reporter Liz McKernan has the photos you'll only see on 7 tonight. Take one look around and it's not hard to see. David Allen and April Ulibarri lived in a big mess with their three-year-old daughter. Everything they lived in probably on a daily basis, they probably thought that was normal for, for them to be in that kind of filth and those deplorable conditions. I, I felt sad for him. A few weeks ago, the couple called for medical help. According to police, when officers arrived, they found Ulibari passed out in the living room after using heroin, meth, and marijuana. Only a few feet away, officers found their three-year-old daughter sitting in a bathtub filled with nearly six inches of cold water. In a closet nearby, the family dog was locked in this closet full of feces, maggots, and trash. Their own personal hygiene. Um, things around the house, just basic care, buying, buying food, uh, cooking, stuff like that, doesn't matter anymore. Their number one priority is themselves and getting that high and everything else they don't really care about, especially with, when it comes to children. The only clue a three-year-old lived here, the scattered toys and children's DVDs only a few feet away from loaded glass pipes. Cigarette butts coat the floor, several lighters left in the bed and on the floor in every room. Storage cabinets filled with needles and cans with drug residue, not food. A living space that's now left the mom and dad facing child abuse and animal cruelty charges. In Albuquerque, Liz McKernan, KOAT, Action 7 News. The toddler is now in CYFD custody. Ulibati posted bond soon after her arrest. Allen remains in jail. <laughs> So I guess first we want to just ask kind of what what are your reactions to that scene? Anything that you want to say or share before we come? I need your time. I think we need your should not have been an option. Bond, get hosting bond. Social should services have should have taken bond. immediate custody of that child and removed them from that home. Home. And leave mom in jail. She's already out. I, I, we should have left her. We should have given her bond back foot. Well, and unfortunately, these are the kind of scenes that our social workers do go out and run into. And what we, what we have to do then is take something like this and make it real for the family to help them change, okay? And so um, what we want to do is using that clip there, we want to talk about how would we... Sorry, I put my little clicker down. Oh, thanks. <laughs> How would we um, write a harm statement from that scene? And so we decided we would let you all help us. So it was reported that. So what would we put in the what happened? Mom and dad were both using drugs as evidenced by the appearance of drug paraphernalia all over the home and their, their status of being intoxicated. Right. Heroin, meth, and marijuana. All Very good. You're good at this. You're um, hired. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I don't 
don't even know if I have much more to add. And we also have the hazards around the home: needles, lighters, cigarette butts. The home was right. Was strewn with garbage. Yeah. And then, what was the impact on the child? Child was potentially. Sorry. Yes, but what specifically, ha what did they say that happened? Where they found that? Full of water, six inches high. Yeah. So that's the impact. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this time, that was the mm -hmm. impact, that's right. Because there may could have been, we'll get to that danger statement, but there could have been a lot of other impacts from that. But in this particular case, that is what it is. So Tammy's writing that out for us. And that, so that oh, is great. your harm statement, yeah. And it takes something that's pretty complicated and makes it into something that is simple and easy to communicate about. And many times we write these with families together. So it's, we do what we just did right here. Rather than having to kind of argue back and forth about things, we come in and talk with them and we create this together. Can I, can I just sure. interject something? So the way we used to do before, did this before we started using this type of language is we would have talked to the parents and said, so you've created an environment injurious to your child's welfare. Does that sound like something most people <laughs> understand? Okay, and, and they would have gotten caught up in arguing with us about whether they were actually high or not, and blah, 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 blah. And we're like, okay, you know, we're not really here for you to admit anything to us. We're just going to try to focus on what, what did we find and what was the impact to your child. And that's what Katie's talking about. If you can engage them on a level, because I know that visceral response is throw away the key, right? You're like, put them in jail and throw away the key, but that's not reality, okay? She's already out on bail, mm -hmm. and guess what policy tells us we have to do with this mom and dad? We have to work on it. And guys, that's what gets me up every day, because I believe mom and dad can get it together and can raise their child and can be healthy and, and act protectively. If we didn't think that, we wouldn't come to work every day, right? And so how do we engage them in a way so that they are on board with us and wanting to get better? And this is it, this right here. Because even these parents, once they sober up, once they get to a place where they're able to have a rational discussion, they're going to recognize that leaving their kid in, in a tub of six inches of cold water was not a good thing to do. And that's where you hook them. So danger statement. So we have the harm statement, and then the second piece we would do is the danger statement. So what are we worried about for the future? And this helps us then plan for the, for the next time. And so uh, who was worried in this scenario? Police and Police. DSS. Police, DSS. So some who called. I threw in the news didn't reporter. The, didn't the parent call? They called themselves. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, yeah. So the, that was so, funny. You know, I always think in Abel, that they must have been worried too about it. Mm -hmm. they all at some level, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the child Parents, and a lot of times that happens police, when they call because they are worried about their child. Like if it was just them in the home, maybe not. But they do call because they have a child and they know that they've kind of gone past where they can actually care for the child. Might pass out. Yeah. So we have who's worried and then we say, um, so we, we said DSS, the police, maybe even they are worried, possibly the news reporters worry, that what might happen? So what would the what part be? What might happen again? You take that impact piece. The child might drown in the bathtub. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped to the impact. Yeah, what happened? So we had the, that they might use drugs again, right. take, <laughs> use drugs again. Leave the home with Leave hazards. Lying around that the child might hurt them. Well, I'm going to impact. Oops. No, but yeah. Maybe leave, use, leave drug product lying around on the floor. Mm -hmm. the child might child pick could up a needle them. and put it. That's right. That's the themselves. future impact. They could inject themselves, could drown. I heard also, did you say something else that could happen? May not remember buying to buy food. Right, may not even remember to meet basic needs like food, could leave them um, home alone and pass out to the point that no one knows about that. Child can introduce the environment of the home, the dog feces and the physical other pieces of the home besides the dog. So we would write those things out and we would get buy-in just like we did around the harm statement with the family. Are you worried about this? Are, do you think that this is possible if this happened again, that this could happen? 
And many times families can go there because now we're talking about their children and they are worried about that. And so uh, then we are able to kind of move past danger statement to where, what are we going to do now? Now that we've, we've agreed that there's an issue, what are we going to do? And Tammy's going to talk a little bit about case decisions. <coughs> So that's to try to illustrate to you how we gather that information, how we buy, have buy-in from the family. And so after we gathered all of the information we can gather in the investigative phase, we're at the point where we're making a decision about does this family require ongoing involuntary services or can we close our case either with no services recommended or a referral to some um, voluntary services. So. We're looking again, remember we're looking at what were the threats of danger. Think back to that video clip, were there threats of danger? Ooh, yeah, okay. Was a three-year-old child vulnerable to all of those threats of danger? Yes. Yeah. Did those parents exhibit any protective capacity? Possibly by calling at some point, but that's about it, right? So is that a vulnerable child who is at risk of future harm and the parents are not exhibiting protective capacity? Yes. yes then you're sent in that case for involuntary services. And that's how we make case decisions. And so depending upon the track, whether it's investigative assessment or the forensic, the family assessment or a, a forensic response, if, the, if it's a forensic response, we're gonna find a substantiation or an unsubstantiation. That's the difference in the technical terms. For a family assessment response, we're saying they either need services, they're in need of services, that's the involuntary finding, or we're saying we've provided some services, it's no longer needed, we're recommending some voluntary services to you, or no services were recommended. So it's a technical decision, it's a technical response there. But you know what, a lot of times, and I'm gonna show you some stats, a lot of times we find that the children are safe. And that's the vast majority of what we deal with, is that the children are safe and they are cared for in their homes. So I wanted to just go over the data here just, just briefly. And um, that same time frame that Katie talked about, ultimately what you need to understand here is that we made over 2,200 decisions between family assessment and forensic. The assist for other counties, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna touch on that in a second, but between family assessment and forensic, we made over 2,200 case decisions in Beckham County in that time frame. Only 406 of those went for involuntary services. So the other part of that, we found that the children were safe enough to be with their families without involuntary services. Is that shocking to you or surprising? Make you feel a little better about the county we live in and the, and the job parents are doing? It does me. I wanted to mention 298 assist. Mission Hospital is the regional hospital for trauma for children. And so we do a lot of work with Mission Hospital. <laughs> Their hospital social workers and I are BFFs. We are in contact with each other all the time. We host a regional meeting. Um, Mission Hospitals and I get together and invite all of the regional counties to come in and meet about that because that's where they send babies who are hurt and young children who are hurt really severely. And so the assist part of that is we're usually the ones responding to the pediatric floor, pediatric ICU, and working with the doctors and the nurses about those immediate decisions that have to be made about the children's care and interviewing perpetrators. If you find a difficult situation like this, but grandma's willing to take the child, uh -huh. do you take the child into custody or do you let grandma take care of the child? Excellent question. Um, if the family has a viable option available that can care for the child, and then they check out. And so we have to run some background checks and some criminal record checks and that kind of thing. If they have significant criminal history, or we have history where they were a caretaker and we've had lots of involvement with them, which unfortunately is often the case, we can't approve that. But if it's someone who can care for the child, who we feel like understands the nature of the concern and is willing to work with us around protecting the child, then absolutely. The other thing that we have to consider is, is this a situation that's gonna resolve itself in about 90 days? Because that's about what amount of time we're allowed by policy to do what's called a kinship care arrangement without invoking the jurisdiction of the court. This is not a 90 day fix. 
you know, right here, this is not a 90 day fix. When you're talking significant substance abuse and addiction like this, these people are not going to be ready and able to take their child back in 90 days. So in a situation like this, we would take custody of the child, and then if there's a relative that's available to care for the child and is appropriate, we can ask that the court sanction that placement and place the child with the family, but we have custody. Does that answer your question? Um, absolutely. Okay. Any other questions before I turn it back over to you, Katie, to finish out on family in-home? Does any of this ever become legal kind of evidence like if you're getting the family to say yes we did this then does that get do you turn it over to law enforcement. prosecutors and law enforcement um, very good question and absolutely and oftentimes we get confessions that law enforcement doesn't get because we're we don't have guns and badges and uniforms and all of that stuff and so oftentimes we're the ones that the families tell the actual truth to um, and so Remember back to my statement, I'm all about families having the opportunity to change and do better, but I'm also all about people being held accountable for hurting children, and we work very collaboratively. Our Sheriff's Department's awesome in the amount of work that we do with them collaboratively and APD, and so um, we, they have access. We, Mandy worked with um, the Chief and with the Sheriff, and they have access to our records when we have a joint open case. They can go in and read our narrative verbatim. And so, yes, they have access to everything that we do with families. And if they can use that prosecutorially, they do. I, yes. I'm sort of concerned about that safety. Um, and this is the question. When they get a complaint, do they go in alone? The social workers? Yes. Yes, they do most of the time. But we also have um, a, a deputy who works with their after hours on call. Um, he is under contract, and so he responds with them. And if we ever feel like they need someone to go out with them, we can certainly call law enforcement and they're always happy to go with us. I won't say they're happy, but they're always willing to go with us um, and help us in those situations. But again, I mean, I just cannot brag enough on the staff that we have because, guys, this takes, this takes a special person to walk up cold call to a door and knock on the door and walk into that and be able to deal with it. And at the end of the day, Guess who that mom is probably hugging and thanking? Seriously, at the end of the day, it's the social worker. And so they're very skilled in how they work with families and, and I'm always amazed every day at the amazing work that they do. And the, and the limited amount of complaint calls we get, I know I feel like I get them all the time, but when you look at the volume that we deal with, very few complaints on social workers, very few. Any other questions? All right, so now we're going to talk about where, what happens to those 406 cases that we found in need of services or substantiated. And they go to what's called in-home services, and this is a mandated in-home services. And sometimes it gets confusing because I know other type of mental health and different places have in-home services, but this is Child Protective Services in-home. And I um, oversee five supervisors, although we do, just like we talked about in investigations, have one person who has a blended team of in-home workers and foster care workers. Otherwise, these are, um, each have five in-home worker in their units. Mm -hmm. uh, I-A-T-S-W, I know S-W stands for social worker, I is investigative. <laughs> It is uh, investigative assessment treatment. It's an old kind of term that is used. It's how you classify them. So that's what, the, that's what that stands for. Because they're all child protective services, even though we split them versus investigators and in him. All right, so um, when, once we get involved in in-home services, we have 30 days, a social worker does, to create a case plan with the family and that is called your family services agreement and what we talked about at the in the signs of safety approach is what we're we work on within that agreement where we talk about what do we want this to look like the safety goals and then what is the safety plan and how are we going to meet those needs so if we have um two or three harm or danger statements one about drugs and alcohol one about uh, supervision, you know, we may break that down and we'll have goals and safety plans for each of those. And they'll be really behaviorally specific and that is new in the last few years. You know, you used to hear that 
in-home workers were more case managers, sending them to a lot families to a lot of services and looking to see if they checked the boxes of the services. And what we realized is that just because you've gone to a bunch of appointments doesn't mean that your child is any safer. And so we are talking about breaking, doesn't mean we won't send people to services, but what is it that we wanna see happen? What's the behavior that needs to change? And that's what we are talking about in in-home. And so sometimes that involves services and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes families can meet safety um, requirements and change the environment within their home without that. And so we talk about what that looks like. The safety goal really is not negotiable. It's child welfare's bottom line. This is what we have to see happen. We have to see sober caretakers for this child. How we get there is where we negotiate with the family about what would that look like and what can we talk about? What worked for you and your family? Because it's not the same for everyone. And so um, who is your safety network? Who are the people that can come in and help you get clean and sober and care for your child? Like even you were talking about where grandma steps in or someone in the family. So we look at both professional, formal supports and then informal supports as well. Usually, and this has changed some, you used to hear in-home services might go a year or two years. Well, mm -hmm. that we realize, just like other parts of the organization, that that's not really fair to families. It doesn't, it isn't best for children. And so we need to shorten that amount of time. And so we're looking at a six month or so turnaround for the behavior change. And that's tight. If you're talking about substance abuse, if you're talking about serious mental illness, if you're talking about some domestic violence that's recurring, you know, we have a, we have a lot of things that need to change um, pretty quickly. And so we talk about how we're gonna get there and what that would look like. We have, and you'll see in a few minutes when we look at the data, but most of our families are successful in staying with children, staying in the home or staying with relatives and not entering Child Protective Services custody. Um, and so we do make that happen and we're really excited to be able to say that this is why in-home is important. It keeps people out of the court system a lot of the times and it also helps children remain safely in their home. For those that aren't able to meet those requirements and the child is still unsafe uh, at those different markers, we then look at a filing a juvenile petition in district court and we can talk we can talk a little bit more about that but i will tell you that um three so uh we had in the last year so those same numbers um 377 families successfully complete in home which is a great number and then 84 children came into custody in that same time period which is uh 86 percent coming in after that 90 days. So it wasn't an immediate removal. That might have been what happened on that uh, news clip that we saw, but it was more a chronic kind of thing, that they couldn't meet the meet needs over time, so we had to file a petition in juvenile court and children enter care at that point. Or maybe a new incident happened that rose to the level that we had to take immediate custody. Uh, uh, sometimes we also do things that we file a petition in the court, but we, DSS, never takes custody and the children remain with relatives or family or they remain with parents, but they do it in a way that um, they're not so unsafe that they have to come into care. So an example of that might be if you have a serious domestic violence situation that's recurring and mom is saying at this point that she's not going to return to the offender and does and we feel like this has happened this continues to happen and so we're putting this child at risk and we file a petition but by the time it comes in front of a judge the the person's out of the home the children are safe we don't want to remove the children and so we ask her to work on this behavior so that this pattern doesn't continue but we don't actually remove the children from the home and sometimes that happens later after you know uh, they still may be removed down the road if something comes up but much of the time 126 times in the last year that that those type of situations were safe enough and so children didn't enter custody of the department and so and then i see some you may have some questions about that i see some looks is that not clear 
-hmm. Any questions about that? So just any questions in general? We're kind of at the end of the presentation. That was good. All I, was good. All I can say is wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that is unbelievable what you all have to do. And uh, you're to be congratulated on, on all that. And all those decisions and all those things you have to go through in order to finally find out something to make it work. Uh, it, yes. It, it's a great, great thing, great thing that uh, you all are doing for the people in this county. Thanks for me. Well, thank you. And, you know, the social workers are very busy because they spend a lot of time uh, really engaging families. And so, you know, we, like Tammy was saying, are very proud of the work they do because it is it is a lot of work. And it's hard work. You tell the review board that you did well with your interview in front of the board. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Good. The other, I appreciate it. The thing I like to say is whenever I hear cases on the news, then my immediate response is, I hope that's not Buckham County. And I haven't heard Buckham County in the news with one of those child cases. And I am proud of y'all for keeping us out of that. I mean, it, that's, a, that's a real selfish thing, but I'm proud that we don't get the kind of press that some of our neighboring counties get. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Thank I'm you. serious. It's, it's important. I listen to that, and then I think of all these misguided uh, middle school kids who are shooting people in oh, school right. and everything. I said, oh, wow, because there's something going wrong in that, in that family. Uh, and it's just too bad they don't have you all to look at it to start with. But anyway, uh, great job, great job. Okay, Mandy. Um, we sent to you some very detailed information about what the impact we would have felt and in some instances did feel related to the federal shutdown. Um, that got resolved at least temporarily, so we weren't going to talk about it in as great a detail. I think I actually sent you the PowerPoint that I did for commissioners, but did, and um, Jim, I don't know if you and Jennifer want to jump in at all, but did want to again make the point we we're very concerned we'll face the same situation in January. Um, the, the, you know, you saw. WIC benefits were actually stopped and then that was um, retracted. Um, work first benefits were actually stopped. The cash assistance that goes to families and employment services. Um, and we were a couple of days away from food and nutrition services, food stamps being stopped, which got almost no play in the media, which was interesting to us. Um, the impact of the shutdown for Buncombe County $196,000 a day would have been the impact of those lost revenues for us. We'd still been required to provide the services. What we are most concerned about is food and nutrition services, what we call TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, which in addition to Work First supports child welfare, much of child welfare, and Social Service Block Grant, which is the only funding we receive for adult protective services None of those have been reauthorized in several years. Um, they've been operating on continuation budgets, and there is much fear I'm on a, um, a national committee that's actually having a conference call on Tuesday to talk about what if none of those are reauthorized in the upcoming session. So we just think you have to be aware of those because the impacts are significant for them. Um, the RTNF money at risk is $2.4 million. Um, about half, a little over half a million in the SSBG, and then when you actually talk food nutrition services, 68 million in benefits um, in the community, and 120 thousand dollars a month in administrative costs for us that are at risk. So it bears watching. We just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Thank you. Our next meeting is on the. 22nd of next month, of November, and we're going to be meeting at Cox Avenue, uh, if I'm not mistaken. We are. You're going to have your economic services overview and actually tour Cox for those of you who have not yet done that. And so I want to make sure you get that. Uh, we'll send you information. Chris okay. will send you where to meet. Yep. Now, I, I, I'm going to... Well, you said the 20th. 22nd, I believe I was told. No, but no. That's the fourth. 
Fourth Four. Friday. Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 20 seconds. November 22nd, yes. Okay. Chris just said Thanksgiving was late. Thanksgiving is on the 28th. Mm -hmm. So it's the next week. I'm going to ask, if you will, if you are a manager in any capacity in the health and human services, I want you to come up front right now. Anybody on staff who is a manager, would you please come up front? Come on, folks. You did have the word please. Anyway. Supervisors, department heads, Supervisors. managers, division heads. And also, department heads, you can, you're included also. I did it once last week. Don't everybody can't be in the back row. <laughs> it's like you did church. <laughs> it's, it's a good thing you have staff to do all the work because y'all are here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Mandy, if you will come forward too. They won an award. And for the best practice award, innovations and customer service. Mm -hmm. and That's awesome. That's from the uh, state DSS people who have presented that award, and well done, folks. And it had to be your leadership and all the people that work with you to make that happen. Well, it came from the DSS Association. It's specific to integrated health and human services is the category that it won in, customer awesome. services and integration. That's very nice. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any uh, announcements? Or if not, do I have a motion that we adjourn? Yep. Uh, always. Second. Afternoon. Put your hand up. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.